Hey guys, before we start the episode, I'd like to thank our March Patreon supporters. So we have a new supporter, Amber McKissick, and we have someone increasing their pledge, Jules. Thank you so much. As well as just let you guys know for the month of March, I have suspended payments for Patreon. So if you're already a member, don't worry. That way we can give everyone some time to figure out what our new normal is because coronavirus has basically almost shut down parts of the United States, especially where I am in Ohio. A lot of businesses have temporarily closed. And so I now got a lot of time to do this. (laughs) But back to our regularly scheduled programming. Welcome back, Collective. I'm back here with Jacob. Hey guys. Who does the podcast on Germany. And we're both enjoying delicious beverages. I'm drinking an Oktoberfest because Germany. <laughs> I like yours says just says yeah, taco a shop on it. Not sponsored, by the way. I'm not sponsored, guys. It's just where I ate tonight. So la- last last episode, we talked about the White Rose Movement, which was Courtney's. Yes. Courtney from Cult of Domesticity for my fans. Today, uh, for today's episode, we're actually going to be switching over to the United States I'm talking about someone from my hometown, or one of my hometowns. I moved around a lot. I still (laughs) move around a lot. This is my seventh state at the age of 27. So, you know, I'm sure this won't be my last one either. Wait, the real question is, how many states have you had your podcast in? Because I'm at at two as well. Oh, wait. Are we counting? If we're counting recording, I did record in Kansas because I was in a hotel. Uh, I've, I've recorded in Texas. And Tennessee, so I guess that bumps me up to four as well. But I've only lived in two states uh, while recording. Yeah, yeah, I've lived in two states, three cities. Nice. So, so one of them is the same state, just opposite <laughs> ends of the great O H. Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, you're going I to am. a darker place, which my listeners are so used to me going to the deep dark places uh, my listeners i i mean we will eventually get to the deep dark places we we're, we're mm-hmm. covering german history there's a lot of dark material to cover not just the nazis but other parts as well uh but this episode is very dark and it was a very dark one for me to research also very hard for me to research because a lot of this information is kept kind of on the down low uh because of how well, how deep it went. Ugh, are we getting so, corruption? I love when you get corruption. We are getting corruption. We're going back to yes. 1950, September 15th. Okay, so I'll put my hair in some victory curls. I'll get a girdle and a big poofy skirt. Uh, it, it is the, it's the height of America. We won World War II. We're, bo- we're booming economically. Everyone wants to be, you know, that... Man and wife, kids, white picket fence, all of that. It's going on right now. Oh, Americana, the cult of domesticity is right. taken off. And in Tennessee, a newspaper article states that one Beulah George Tan, known to her friends as Georgia, passed away and talks about how she had done so much charitable work for Memphis, for the state of Tennessee, even for California by setting up these adoption agencies. It mentions how she had worked with Eleanor Roosevelt in developing childcare, and how she had even attended Truman's inauguration. That's, I mean, great accomplishments. You know, Truman, hanging out with Eleanor. But I feel like this you're building a straw man, and we're going to set that man on fire. Next page, it mentions <laughs> that a case had been brought up against Sir George Tan, and a totally, completely different article. Very, very, very small print. Uh, nowhere near the front page. So page 8, Basically, back page, in the, co- in the crease, so you, like, yeah, you, you have, have to, to look, look for, for this it. one. And it mentions that the governor of Tennessee had been considering bringing charges against Georgia Tan because she had made money off of the, her society of around $1 million. And hey! that was it. And for the governor of Tennessee, for the mayor of Memphis... For thousands of parents who had children thanks to Georgia Tan, they hoped that was going to be it, but it wasn't. You said they hoped, and I'm like, when you're hoping that's it, that means the other shoe is going to drop real hard. And it did drop real hard, because eventually, 
all of the naysayers, all those who had been fighting against Georgia Tan for the last 30 years were now being able to come out of the woodwork because she was gone. And they were able to bring up cases of not only of her embezzling money, but of kidnapping children, of stealing kids from their mothers right after pregnancy, all the way to actually driving up to someone's home and snatching the kid off the porch, to having hundreds of kids in terrible condition to the point that for every nine kids she would send out to be adopt another one would have died that's a okay so out of 10 kids nine adopted one dead that's That's still still a dead dead kid kid. and this is with her known record of five thousand adoptees at this point i'm gonna i'm gonna pull up a calculator and do some math because i'm bad at math we've already proven this numerous times on my podcast so that's 500 500 dead dead kids kids. Uh, and this is only of the 5,000 children that we know for sure were adopted through her agency. More stories started coming out of the woodwork about how many of these kids weren't what they were supposed to be. They weren't. They were supposed to be these young children of poor mothers who just couldn't take care of them, who came from a strong background, but were in reality either stolen or were from a poor background, but not the background that Georgia Tan was saying they were. It was from either worse backgrounds or from no backgrounds at all. And these children had issues from drug addictions, from birth to mental retardations, to actual physical abuse by their adoptive parents who simply wanted workers. Solid. This seems like a great situation. I'm sure this is it. The story is going to be all nice, cuddly, well, like... Get your little cup of hot cocoa, be baby Yoda, and just be like, this is fine. And that that is is the end of our story. The very beginning, we actually start in the 1920s. And a great time. I'm sure she's got the cute bob. She goes up and like, hey, kid, do you want a new family? Well, shockingly, she's not like that at all. She's If you would meet her in person, you get the strict school mom persona. So very conservative. Nope. Uh, dress or even manlyish dress as it would be considered back then um v- the hair would either be short or kept up very piercing eyes very strong demeanor she walked with a limp uh, due to a car accident not an overly a warm person at all but one whose strong will was able to bend others to get what she needed she is a woman so at 30s and she died in the 50s so like from the 20s yeah, you need to be a strong woman to take care of business at that point. She had a um, Boston marriage, which if, for those of you all don't know, this means that she had a committed relationship that she would have considered a marriage to Anne Athwood Hollinsworth. However, that was not legal at the time. And so they uh, would get away with it by saying that they were living together, um, basically just as two sisters. And this would keep away those who wanted to try to date them and so forth and allow them to live the life that they wanted. I love the way you could just get, like, if you were LGBTQ in that period, you know, we're sisters. We're just, we're just exactly. two gals on the town. And it's, it was always so much easier for women because they were just like, you need a man in this portion. And they're like, oh, we're just two helpless sisters. Yeah, you're like, fine. Oh, okay, cool. Your siblings, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine, it's fine. She's atypical for the society at that time. She's she's coming across very manly. She's um, She has this Boston marriage, so she's not actively trying to get suitors and so forth. And yet she's able to set herself up to controlling uh, the entire adoption uh, agency for the city of Memphis. And then being able to set up satellites in Los Angeles and across the state of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. That's impressive. And being able to do this for 30 years without any competition whatsoever. She's She's on the top of her game. She's living her best life. I'm not (laughs) saying it's a great life, but she's living her best life. She's also doing this at a time where adoption's not a thing. Like, uh, before, like, 1925, people were scared of eugenics, you know? So... They don't know what your background is. They don't know who your parents were. So they want something that's pure, something that they know is coming from good stock. And adoption's not that. So at best, most adoption places would get maybe five adoptions a year. And this is 1920. In 1928, she would be arranging on average 200 adoptions. In eight years, she's flipping it over. 
to the point that it's a lucrative business. Yeah. She changes adoptions. That's yes. really impressive. It's very impressive. It's also very sad considering the impact she'll have on that for, um, well, how we do adoptions today. So um, she gets her start in Memphis. Uh, she doesn't start in Memphis, Tennessee. I should apologize. She actually starts in Mississippi, where she's originally from. Um, she's... played <laughs> so much. So much. We're just going to throw some state prejudice out there. Explain so much. <laughs> well, she um, she had some strong support. Uh, she had her father, George Tan, uh, or sorry, George Tan, who had very deep pockets and very strong connections to uh, the local government. So she could set up herself as a social worker and make some money on the side there. And it's there that we believe she did her very first kidnapping with uh, a person named Rose Harvey. No, Rose Harvey had been on Georgia's a uh, little radar because she was white and she was lower class. And those were what Georgia Tan considered the cash cows for adoption agents. So uh, she was this young, she was poor, she was widowed, which was also a huge plus in Georgia Tan's eyes. And um, she was known to be suffering some medical issues, diabetes and so forth. Oh, and you could not treat diabetes no. very well back So then. Rough, rough life for Rose Harvey. She has uh, two kids and she has a third on the way. Her two-year-old son is playing on the back porch when uh, Georgia, who's been spying on them, notices that Rose is asleep in the back room. And so she pulls up in her car and lures the son out to her car. She then takes him into the car and drives away to her father, who signs documents saying that Rose was unfit to be the parent of her two-year-old son. Um, And so the son is sent off to be adopted, and his three-year-old brother would follow the next year. And I'm sorry, what? She had her yep. father sign. Which was perfectly legal due to his position within the community and as a lawyer. So. I have so many feelings. I'm going to shut my mouth, though, because I have so many the feelings about good this. news is for Mississippi is that they instantly turned against her for doing this. And they drove her out of the state, which meant that she would show up in Memphis in 1924. Good for Mississippi. Very bad for Memphis. Memphis. Yeah. But good for Mississippi for calling to be like, yep. no, I call that bullshit. I call that bullshit. She she moves to Memphis in 1924 and she's able to set up shop thanks to a this guy who was running the entire town. His name was Edward Hall Crump. And do you, do you know who Boss Tweed was? Okay, he's like that from yeah. Memphis. So basically, listeners, if you don't know who Boss Tweed was, it was like a political machine in New York. And they would get people like if you wanted to get someone elected, he could get someone elected. He would just basically pay people to come up to the polls and do that. He would run the whole town. We kind of don't really have people who run whole towns anymore, at least blatantly like this. They're not out there with their mustache and their top hat being like, whoa. Oh, you need something. Yeah, we don't we don't have that as, at least as obvious as we do did back then. But Edward <laughs> Hall Crump was to Memphis as Boss Tweed was to New York City, and he not only controlled the city, but he could also control the state government over in Nashville. Uh, he had cronies scattered throughout uh, the entire state, and so Georgia Tan got on his good side and would, of course, pay him fees but also help promote the town and her businesses, which was something that Crump was trying to do. I'm not going to lie. When you said she got on his good side, I was going to make a dirty joke. And I did it. I'm very proud of myself. I, was, I got on his good side. Which side? Well, not that way. At least not that I believe so. No, it doesn't seem like she goes that way, which yep. is fine. But I mean, ladies got to do what a lady's got to do to build a business. Yeah, she would. Um, so he would let her set up business. She would get a... Two extremely important allies. One is named Abe Waldor. I'm pretty sure I mispronounced that name because it's not a typical name I've seen before. But I'm going to say Waldor. And uh, he's a lawyer who Ooh. who did everything that you think bad of a lawyer doing. From Never mind. Well, what? I was going to say, ooh, he's a lawyer. Yeah, look at her getting a, like getting the good cronies. And then you're like, every worst thing. Okay, never mind. That's oh, yeah, a bad he person. Was still, he Uh, If parents uh, would try to go take her to court for stealing their kids, he would rip them to shreds in court. He once wrote her a letter stating that he had driven a woman to tears and questioning her own sanity for trying to get her kids back. So he gaslighted a woman. That's not great. He would also, anytime something would be brought up to like the state or federal, he would always 
undermine it, either by making sure the right people were put in place to support Georgia or going as far as destroying evidence and uh, threatening people. So he's, he's if, he, if he's your lawyer, he's a great, he's a lawyer, great to have lawyer in your pocket. In your pocket, but otherwise, no. No. Yeah, you definitely no. don't want to face him in court. The other was juvenile court judge Camille Kelly, who would provide Georgia about 20% of all kids that she would eventually adopt out. 20% of 5,000. Well, technically, you know, 5,500. <laughs> okay, wait, let's do some more math. You said yeah, 5,500? The kids that passed away. Well, the 500 was of the dead kids. Well, I mean, oh, like, 5,000 were adopted out. That meant another 500 died um, on top of that. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, again, not great at math. So, a quarter of that is 1,375. Holy shit. Yeah. That's a she lot of would, children. She would be a key component in Georgia's um, ability to sever ties for many of the parents to their old kids. And would pretty much rubber stamp any of the kids that Georgia wanted to be adopted. No matter what the case was. You stole a candy bar. You're getting adopted. You walked in the park after dark. Yep. You're getting adopted. And the parents couldn't do anything because she was a judge. So all of this is working. This is all set up by Georgia or for Georgia to allow her to run for the next 30 years this massive adoption agency. Now in the beginning, of course, she's running against societal norms. She's has nothing to go off yeah. of. So she starts doing massive campaigns. She'd take pictures of kids in orphanage scattered throughout, and she would show them off to people she thought would like to buy them. And now she didn't care what the adopted, uh, what the adoptees were like. So if the, uh, sorry, the adopters, if what the adopters were like. So if the parents were rude, had issues of domestic violence, clearly drunks, uh, we're not going to be together, things like that. Damn it, bother her. They didn't even have to be a family. As long as they had the money, they had their kid. This reminds me, you know those commercials about, like, there is a starving yeah. kid in Africa? That's what this is reminding me of. They're like, you can sponsor a child instead of a sponsor child. They're like, you can adopt a child. No questions asked. No questions it's asked. It's fine. It's fine. Would you like a child? Here is a child. Yeah, she, um... She was able to do this. Now, she was supposed to check up on them, but she would technically do that by just going over, um, saying hi to the um, to the parents and then leaving, never really checking on the kids or their welfare. And most of the time, she didn't even do that because that was just too much a hassle. She has 5,000 kids out there. She doesn't want to have to keep up with all of them. I'm sure she was a great oh, social just worker. one of the best. She was the most hated in, <laughs> um, in Tennessee. Most social workers hated her because they realized that she was in this for the money she didn't care for the kids no one goes into social work for she the did. money and she made money off it i mean that one million i was telling you about at the very beginning that's mm -hmm. actually not the amount of money she probably made she could make quite a few thousands of dollars off of certain adoptions and most of those adoptions wouldn't be of that <sighs> five thousand that we know of because they would want to keep it secret the secret she spent most of that money though on her child, who was also adopted, or herself. Uh, that way, when she died, no one could get to it. She was basically pen penniless when she died. That's a crafty way to get around it. You're going to say I'm leaving millions. Mm -hmm. I've got no money, guys. Spent it all. But, so, she goes out, taking these pictures, and she starts promoting the idea that eugenics is wrong, okay? It doesn't matter what their past is. What matters is their future and how you can mold them. So it used to be, you know, they think it was like 75% their genes is how that kid's going to come out. Mm -hmm. She flips that and says, no, 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 no. It's like 90% how you raise the kids, especially after, uh, before the age of one and up, that will actually shape them. Mm -hmm. So she is a fan of the nurture of the nature versus nurture yes, aspect. Yes, she believes that the nurture was far more important than nature. And uh, she wanted to give them this idea that the kid was a blank slate. Anything they wanted could be this kid. And that's how she would start marketing these children. And she would start changing things about the kids. She'd usually make them younger because she promoted the idea that the younger they are, the more moldable they are. And this would be from like a few weeks or months to years. This would also make the kids seem brighter because 
they seem to be far more developed than typical two to three year olds when they're really like four. She um, she would take pictures, put them in what we call Christmas ads, which would basically show this little boy like with a ball saying he's ready to play. He's ready to play baseball. He just needs a dad or these kids could be your Christmas presents. <sighs> Things like that. She pulls at those heartstrings oh, she so did. hard. And these would be ads that went throughout the nation. Eventually, by the uh, by the time of her death, or by her time of her retirement, she had a waiting list for all of the Americas, from Canada all the way down to Chile and Argentina. Dang! Yeah, she was the most popular of the adoption agencies in the Western Hemisphere. That is really impressive for a horrible person. Yep. And she she never stopped working. She was she was always on the move, always trying to make, promote the next idea. Her entire life was built around this facade, and her home was built around this facade. So she has a home in uh, downtown Memphis. I'm trying to blank on the name of it right now, uh, but it's right off Poplar Avenue. And this home had a front to it. So when the, the parents would come in, the adoptive parents would come in, they'd see a beautiful home with pictures of loving kids, teddy bears, and bright lights, bright colors. And they'd go into the crib room and they'd see three beautifully white cribs in a pink room with one baby in each crib, perfectly picked kids. Usually blonde hair, blue eyes. And they would pick up their kid and they would trade, they would pay for the kid and then they could leave. And that's all the adoptive parents would see. But in reality, that was just like half of the house. The other half was where all the kids were waiting that weren't those three. You'd have six babies to a crib. Yeah. You'd have one mattress for a bunch of the uh, kids ages from three to five. Six babies to a... That's not nope. big enough. You'd have dehydration. You would have kids dying from uh, lack of food, from sicknesses, from illnesses, because there was no... They, they had a bucket to use, or the nurse who was busy at the front wouldn't be coming back or was too drunk to deal with them. They had... A, abusive punishments for instance a lot of times if they got in trouble georgia or her nurses would literally take the kids and hang them by their arms on coat hangers in the closet mm -hmm. no God, that's many one cre creative and two horrifying because think of how bad that hurts because it's like eventually your the yeah, joint's gonna come out kids who's who aren't very strong to begin with and so they most of the time they would have broken arms from that there was um at least one, maybe two, who would take advantage of the kids who were under her employee. And she knew but didn't care because it didn't hurt her didn't hurt her money. She still was making a profit. So she hired two pedophiles uh, to work in her own home. Um and this was just her home. She also rented out to baby farmers. She had um local uh orphanages that she would randomly just go and sweep for kids. She had connections everywhere in the state and eventually in Los Angeles when she builds her little um, center out there. Her child, child center. center. Her child her child farming center. Her child farm. There we go. It's a child farm because they're not babies at this point. Well, so there, there, it's a child a farm. Um, so sometimes the kids would be older. You know, four or five, sometimes up into the teens, but at that point they're usually being sent out to work uh, by Georgia. Uh, or just been given away, basically, because they're useless to her. But there are a lot of times where um, the mother's in the hospital. She's just had the baby, okay? A lot of pain. A lot of pain, a lot, a lot of, of drugs. drugs. This is when they were... Oh, this is where they're still knocking you out yep. when you pop out a kid. Extremely exhausted. And then this woman, dressed in all white like a nurse, walks up and tells you, this is routine paperwork. Please sign. You sign the paperwork thinking it is routine paperwork. Turns out you just signed over your brand newborn baby to Georgia Tan and her adoptive agency. And then they sweep out. Or, let's say you're single. Let's say uh, there's no father. Well... They hear about it. They wait for you to have the baby. Then they come to you and they tell you, you can either give us that baby or we'll take you to court for it. And most of the time they'd have to give up the baby because the court was so heavily in favor of Georgia Tan that it was going to cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars to even try to stop her. And so a lot of times these are newborn babies yeah. that are just being yanked 
and then being put six to a crib. And you have to think about it this way. If you're a single mom, you probably don't have the resources. Your family might have disowned you. Especially at this point. Yeah, there's no like, there's no uh, forgiveness for being a single mom. This is like, this sounds like a little bit like the mother and child homes in Ireland around the same period where they're like, well, you're pregnant. This is where you're going. Uh, and um, surprisingly, I was doing, I was looking at some of the numbers before, uh, before the 1920s. A lot of time, the single moms were actually just told to raise their kids. So they were left with the kids because the state didn't want to have to deal with them. And um, the family wasn't going to deal with them. So a lot of times, these single moms would be keeping, would be raising their kids. And so you go from like 1918, 1919, where, take for instance, I think it was Wisconsin. Yeah, uh, Wisconsin had 200 kids taken away from single mothers to switching that around to 1928 where uh, georgia tan is now pulling kids from that state as well as other adoptive agencies and it's upwards to 1900 kids are being taken every year so you go for 200 to 1900 in less than 10 years i feel like there's <laughs> math involved in that right, 1900 that's almost a 10 like a 10 percent well, I guess 110% or something increase. Basically, I did not do that math right, but it's like nine and a half times more babies getting taken out like each year to yeah, get to that she's, point. She's totally rewriting this uh, system by doing this. And these kids would be given off sometimes to uh, rich uh, families and like governors and uh, especially congressmen in Tennessee. So that way they'd be on her side. To uh, even some famous actors and actresses over in Hollywood, such as Joan Crawford, who would actually have one of her kids, uh, thanks to Georgia Tan. I mean, you don't ruin your That's body true. that way. You can keep acting <laughs> in those pictures. So uh, she's she's giving all these kids out. She does have resistors. There are those people who are actively trying to fight her. And those are the ones who will come out after her death and are able to release all this information. These go from social workers to lawyers to priests to nuns, all actively trying to fight her. But every time they try to get a law passed in Tennessee, she some uh, Georgia was able to get it like grandfa grandfather herself and her society uh, into that law. So like, for instance, they made a law that everyone had to be processed. Everyone had to be processed by the state before they could adopt. Well, she was able to get it grandfathered in that her society wasn't part of that because it wasn't registered in a certain way. And she was also able to get laws that really helped her pass, such as one that made it illegal uh, for the adoptees to have their records. This was done, of course, to make sure that any kids that she kidnapped couldn't trace back their parents and vice versa. The records were now sealed by the state and this would start spreading. Um, it's why, It's part of the reason why... Nowadays, if you're adopted, you can't access your initial records. You can't access your family history. Georgia Tan was part of that movement because she didn't want the kidnapper, uh, the kidnappees, to find their original parents and basically turn uh, everyone against her. I'm sorry, my mind is just blown right now. Yeah, did you not know what? that about adopted kids? I I knew you had to request it, and I thought at like a certain age, but I didn't realize the reason why was so. Because these kids had been kidnapped. And so they're like, yeah, we don't want them finding out that they've been kidnapped. In Tennessee, that is why that law was passed. And it started to become nationwide to protect this triangle. Now, the triangle is really made up. Uh, she, ma she made up hers uh, to protect her clients. Or at least that's why she said she made it up. It was really to protect herself. But the idea was that if they didn't have a brand new record, a brand new birth birth certificate, all of that, then they can actually live a life not stuck in the past of wherever they came from. Now, this means that they can access their medical history, which was extremely important for a lot of these kids. And it also yeah. meant that they had nowhere to go if they were kicked out. They couldn't go home because they don't know where home is. And so if they had abusive adopted parents or they were abandoned, or what have you, they're kind of stuck out there. And usually Georgia Tan would take them and either recycle them and send them else. Or would just dump them to on work farms and so forth. Um, a lot of her kids would be abused uh, by their adopted parents. Uh, she didn't care. As long as they paid their fees and backed her up, then she would leave them alone. Um, a lot of the parents who did honestly want their wanted a baby, they wanted to have a family, would actually become victims of Georgia Tan 
Um, because let's say you lived in Tennessee and you adopted a kid, all innocent, you know, you're wanting, you're wanting a family. You either can't have it or you're worried about childbirth. So you decide to adopt the kid. She, she shows up, she gives you the kid, you pay the fees, everything seems fine. And then she comes to you and says, oh, you can join the kid. That's great. Then a couple of months, listen, there's a law that's coming up right now in the state government. If it passes, your kid could be taken away from you. So it's in your best interest to write letters to your congressman arguing against said laws or arguing in favor of these laws to protect you and your kid from the parent who's still hunting you to get their kid back. And so hundreds, thousands of these people are being blackmailed by Georgia Tan to support her and her her mission, her company. Mm -hmm. Um and so she's getting these laws passed. She's getting all this stuff done. Uh, eventually, 1950, uh, she's uh, 59. She gets cancer. Uh, and I feel like it's the universe saying, ma'am, <laughs> you need, you need stop. cancer. <laughs> you're, ma'am, you're a bit, you're like, one, you're making social workers' jobs so much harder and their job is hard enough. And two, you're stealing children and selling them. Yeah, it seems like, you know. The universe saying Basically. something. Basically. So it's, you know, 1915, she's having, she has cancer. She has kind of stopped running the business. It's starting to fall to the wayside. Other companies are starting to build up, starting to take over. And she has a spending money as fast as she can. She has her, um, her, in her son-in-law and her daughter go on extravagant, extravagant vacations, staying at the best hotels, eating at the finest restaurants. She herself is buying everything she can, and three days before she dies, the state government announces that they're going to indict her for $1 million that she embezzled. The governor actually will shut down that investigation after announcing it. Like, he puts a brand new lawyer in charge of it, and then he shuts it down, because he doesn't want it to be investigated. I mean, it's not a little... I mean, it's just slightly just suspicious. Little. Just just, just a mile-long suspicion alarm goes off. And you're sitting there like, huh, that's weird. Why did he close it? Oh, there's there was a good reason. He was deeply involved in her pockets. Turns out she he was taking bribes. He had, I uh, believe he adopted or was at least on on the way to adopt one of her kids at one point. Um, and he had supported her through his governorship so he's not like he's living in the pot mm -hmm. in her pocket she like opens up her pocket and throws a little bit of crumbs down in there and goes you're exactly. okay for today and so uh, <laughs> they announce it he immediately shuts it down she dies and nothing happened finally oh god i'm not i'm not gonna lie that's the pettiest thing she could do just be like you're gonna investigate me <laughs> dead <laughs> and so she gets away f for it um in fact it's not going to be till 1996 you know yeah, 1996. <sighs> the 90s. Everything, I feel like, started to come out in the 90s. You're like, hey, remember these things? The 90s came, brought it yeah, back they, up. They finally passed the law in Tennessee that opened up her reported cases. So the adoptees could finally find their parents and so forth through, who had been um, adopted out by Georgia Tan. It takes till 1996. If you think about that, that means um, if you're adopted out in the 20s, you're... At best, in your late 70s, if, or 80s at this point, by the time you can actually find out where you came from and, you know, your par who your parents actually were. You know, this reminds me of Japanese mm. internment. Like, they didn't get any rep anything coming out until, like, the late, eight mid to late 80s. We're just like, yeah, let's just keep burying that down deep until we really can't bury it anymore. And then we'll, I guess we'll, like, just, like, you can look. It's so, fine. Then... then uh, to to wrap it all up for them, the 1996 was a big win for them. Problem was, is that she kept terrible records on purpose. Like, for instance, we know that she killed about 500 babies through mistreatment and uh, malnutrition and so forth, uh, and abuse as well. But she only reported three kids ever dying under her care due to unforeseen <laughs> circumstances. So if that's the type of records you could expect for that, you know it's not going to be great when these you know, these 5,000 plus people were trying to find their families. It, it is very heartbreaking. And we owe a lot uh, of our adoption policies to her and the work that she did. Um, I know, such Yay! a such a happy episode. Thank goodness she's dead. Really <laughs> sad that 
Cheers to her Cheers death. To her uh, death. Get, by the way, if you want to research her, good luck, people. It is extremely difficult to do so. Uh, there are very few sources out there that even dare to write books about her. Uh, she's a very close guarded secret by most Memphians and Mississippians. Um, it's just a dark part of their past they don't want to talk about. Um, so, but if you want to, there's some, uh, there's a couple of books out there you can try. Um, and then, of course, uh, you could also start with the Wikipedia and see where s- sources can take you from there. That is a secret. People always, like, crap on Wikipedia. It's a great mm-hmm. place to start and then just use their sources exactly. and work out from there. Uh, I'm going to give, I'm going to just say her career is a raging dumpster fire just because of, one, she oh, yeah. knew what she was doing. So she she was like, it was like, she was a dumpster fire that would just be like, yeah, I'm just going to, like, in time she needed to, she's like, we're going to throw some, like, stood on there to like die it down and then when it would like people would stop looking she's like and here's some gasoline like let's go you know in many ways i find her more scary than like a serial killer just because you know serial killers they always have these weird reasons where you're like oh that's not that's not really human thinking that's no Mm -hmm. no one in the right mind would actually Mm -hmm. do this come on but then you got her where it's like oh i was doing it for money and you're like oh my gosh (laughs) that everyone does stuff for money so how how much of a leap is it for you to kill, you know, 500 kids to make millions of dollars? I mean, that that's, to me, a little bit more terrifying than, um, you know, some crazy guy out there who just kills people for this one weird particular reason. No, it's terrifying because we know for a fact that people have mm-hmm. been doing it for a while. Because, like, yeah, we have the Victorian baby farming and all that. So we know people would sell children for money. It's a long history of doing it. And she was just like, you know what? Let me take, like, she started off as social. She's like, let me take this honorable career and let me drive make it into it the worse. ground and then just yeah like give everyone bad like opinions of it and you're just sitting there like oh my god you sold children and you kept them in these horrible conditions to sell what is mm. happening i just picture with her house too like as soon as someone like would take the baby there like be a little slot in the crib and they would just put <laughs> another baby in there like they would just like so whenever you came there was always three babies and you could pick the baby you wanted you're just like oh i want this baby you walk into the room, there's another baby immediately there. The baby's like, what? I'm not surrounded <laughs> by other new. babies? <laughs> They're like, my whole world has just been other babies and that <laughs> giant monster. But yeah, oh my god, this is terrifying. This is gonna mm. haunt my dreams. You're quite welcome. Thank you. And I'm glad I was able to share a piece of my um, hometown's history with the cold of domesticity and with the fathers of the podcast on Germany. Yeah, we've been planning this, what, since yeah, like Yeah, basically, November? I spent the entire... It's I spent been the a entire bit. Christmas break trying to uh, research on her, trying to find articles and so forth. Um, if you guys haven't, if you go check out uh, Twitter, I actually posted some of those Christmas ads on there. I uh, want to say, what do you say, twer- between Christmas and New Year's, I think it was? Yeah, yeah, it was my favorite thing. All of a sudden I get this notification, there's like just tiny children. I was like, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I think it's like, yeah, it's like back between that. So you ha- you might have to look. I'll definitely look up and find pic- pictures of the ads. But yeah, if you want to haunt your dreams, look it up some more. I know my listeners enjoy their dreams being haunted because they <laughs> keep listening to me talk about oh, I talked about the hello to more and anything that can't haunt your dreams more than that. <laughs> I don't know. It still haunts my dreams. And I did the research. <laughs> but yeah, do you want to tell everyone where they can find you and all the sure, fun so, info? Um, I have a website, www.podcastongermany.com. Uh, you can also find us on Facebook and Twitter, uh, Podcasts on Germany. Easy find. Um, our show is on iTunes, Spotify, and basically all the other databases. Those are the two I know off the top of my head, but we're all the big ones. Um, uh, feel free to stop by, say hi, tell us, tell me about how you found the show, and uh, you know, like, oh man, you were you had the Georgia Tan upset. Uh, it's kind of dark, so <laughs> so looking forward to hearing from you guys. And um, we'll both be back with. You'll be alone next time, I'm assuming. And then I'll be back with a new guest. This is actually the 100th episode of The Cult of Domesticity. Woo-woo! It only took two plus years to get here and numerous breaks. Um, Let's see. We're on like 50, I think we're a year and a half. uh, We'll be a year and three months now. So, you know, you're not that bad. (laughs) I'll probably be around the same. No, I just take I just take breaks when I feel like I need them because I'm alone doing this and I'm like, oh, I hate editing so, so much. <laughs> but yeah, we'll see you guys next week on The Perspective. Go check our podcast out if you're finding mm-hmm. us from the other one and we'll catch you with some new episodes. Bye, Bye guys. Uh- 
Hello everyone, my name is Jacob and I run the podcast on Germany and I am today's guest on the cult of domesticity with Courtney. Before you get into this wonderful episode, I just wanted to take a moment to introduce the show and to let you know what the podcast on Germany is all about. So the podcast on Germany is about the history of Germany from pre-written history all the way to 2000. As of right now, we are in the 300s dealing with the Goths invading the Roman Empire and kicking the Romans around all over the place. In the last two episodes, we've dealt with the Germans being handed dog meat, the Red Banquet, as I like to call it, and a battle in the middle of a willow field. All of which goes terribly, terribly wrong for the Romans and going to end up killing their emperor. But if you want to know more about that, you'll have to go and listen to the show yourself. Okay. That's enough about the show. I don't want to take up any more time from this amazing episode. If you'd like to learn more, please go follow us on Facebook or on Twitter. You can also find us at www.podcastongermany.com. We have a wonderful store full of items that you can buy for yourself or for friends and family. They make great Christmas and birthday gifts. Now, on to the episode. Hey, Sasha. Hey, Courtney. Where can you get hot takes about ghosts? cryptids, farts, and cats? I don't know. Where? On our podcast, Spoop Hour. Oh, that's right. Each week, we talk about the things that spook us out, and we laugh through our fear. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Spoop Hour, and you can listen to our podcast on iTunes, Podbean, or really anywhere else that you get your podcasts. Feel free to also drop us a line at spoophour at gmail.com. We want to hear about your ghosts. Thanks. Of domesticity, we're available on all podcatchers. Remember to rate, review, subscribe to help spread the word, or just force other people to listen to it. Our Facebook and Twitter are at Domestic Podcasts, and our Instagram is at the Cult of Domesticity. We also have podcast merch at Threadless. Uh, as well, if you want to support us financially or show some appreciation, we have a PayPal tip jar and a Patreon, which has some pretty great perks. Any topic suggestions, feel free to email us at domesticpodcast at gmail.com. Remember to stay domestic and cult-free.